Hi everyone, welcome to the P3 Podcast. I'm Phil Kelly and I'm your host today and I can't wait to bring today's guest here and have a great conversation around everything from elite performance, experiencing the most successful, as much as it pains me to stay as a Liverpool fan, the most, uh, most successful British sports team uh, within the Premier League um, and also about the journey around well-being and, and general personal development and how you can you know, really sort of come up against some struggles and, and through learning and development come out the other side and have some really positive visions for the future so without any further ado uh Rodri Jones welcome to the P3 podcast yeah thanks for having me yeah how are you doing today I'm doing okay it's a little bit weird I'm, I'm at home in my well it's a makeshift little office so I've got my two young boys downstairs so I'm sure for that um we um go through this and scare that they don't come in and start piling on me or something yeah so. well, it, it, I think everybody's feeling that at the moment I mean just yeah. for the guys that are listening obviously hopefully way out into the future that we're in the midst of the coronavirus at the moment so we're all on lockdown and we're all trying to make makeshift offices aren't we yeah yeah trying to do the best we can but your story fascinates me Rodri um mainly because we've got a lot of crossover yeah uh but mainly because of the inspiring journey you've been on to where you are today and I think that crosses over with what we do here at Pro Noctis where you know, the P3 podcast is around about um, human performance, well-being, you know, good positive leadership, and that could be self-leadership. Um, yeah. And that journey of learning more about yourself is, is a way of enriching your life. Hmm. Um, and it's a real powerful thing. So just for the listeners at home then, can you just give us a little bit about your background? I mean, you know, your childhood, how you ended up at Man United playing under Alex Ferguson and how that journey then evolved into, you know, your career as a whole? I was always quite sporty as a kid. To be honest, I don't remember a time when I didn't have a football by my side. Um, to the extent in my first year in primary school, I was like five now. The, the same age as my oldest son is the school report at the end of the year. The teacher put at the bottom, good luck with the football. And I was only five. I was kind of like attached to it, really. Um, I just had a natural gift. Yeah, you, you work hard, but, you know, people... St- talk about getting into the state of flow where kind of time time disappears and you're just so in the present and I always had that when I played I, I played in the garden by myself just um pretending that I was a footballer I used man you as a team um my my hero at the time was a guy called Brian Robson Captain Marvel who was United's like captain in the 80s and early 90s and I just when people talk about visualization and stuff that's what I'd be doing for hours in the back garden I'd be playing for a while with my dad and I've got an older brother who's two years above me but they'd soon you know want to go inside and they'd have enough and I'd be out until my mum literally dragged me in where you know it was too dark so I'd, I'd consider even getting a torch out and playing with a torch but I, th- I think it was just it was it was I was just born with that talent really and I had the kind of um, dedication and the and the discipline but to be honest with discipline I didn't need to be disciplined because you know I, time dis- disappeared I'd be playing for hours so what happened then is I, I played for primary school and then you go through the schools level like I know you did um, play for Cardiff schools and then suddenly we're in a different world where I was a bit naive, you know, my mum and dad, not from a footballing background, and then suddenly they're dealing with, my mum's dealing with, like, letters and from all kinds of clubs and phone calls. She's she basically like a secretary for me for a while. And it was probably a bit overwhelming for them. They don't know what, what's the best thing to do for their, for their son. I was quite academic at school. You know, we, we, I remember a club that was really... Um, prominent in Wales at the time was Norwich City they had like a centre of excellence on the border in Chepstow they weren't allowed to come into Wales so you'd have like people like myself Craig Bellamy who's who's a couple of years older and Simon Davis who used to play for Tottenham and Peterborough we'd all kind of go there so that's how Bellamy ended up in Norwich but I was holding back because I was a Man U fan ever since I was a kid and you know they were they were quiet for a while and then I remember my mum had a call from the, the scout. They had a scout in Newport at the time, South Wales scout, and just went through the trial process. You start playing like for the regional South Wales man. You select eleven against maybe like a it was like a Bristol eleven. So just try this, and then you ended up just going through that, um, going through that kind of um, framework really, and ended up signing a scholarship 
um, which which meant leaving home after GCSEs when I was 16 and spending three years uh, up at United at, well, what winded up as one of the most successful periods in their history. Um, when they, I mean, in my first year there, they won the treble. So it was a little bit like you're a youngster trying to break through and you're thinking, oh, <laughs> this is going to be quite difficult because they're, they're, you know, they're probably the best team in the world at the time. That must have been that must have been incredible there, because and I think it's because of the connection between us in terms of our background that where you know granted you were at Man United and I was at Cardiff City up until the age of nineteen. As you were chatting there, it never really dawned on me until then in terms of you know part of the job as certainly an apprentice is obviously like cleaning the changing rooms and doing the, the odd jobs around the stadiums to sort of earn your crust, yeah. isn't it? You know, and, yeah. and and to build that work ethic and development, but. Um, I had a little bit of it when Wales played at Cardiff and obviously the Welsh teams come round. So, you know, you're riding gigs around there for one game. But this is just normal to you. Every game you're going in, you're helping out or every time you're training, you're on the pitch next to basically the most famous football players in the world. Yeah. Well, it, he's talking about Ryan Giggs. I used to clean Giggs' boots and um, I was a centre-half and he had like these like shiny different colour boots. He was, he was still playing left wing at the time. So he never used to tip me, but he used to let me have his old boots. So I'd be, I'd be like centre-half in these like shiny boots and you know, shiny like fluorescent boots on. I was like, ah, oh, doesn't really, doesn't really suit me. But I mean, I don't know if it was for you, but I was in a bit of a bubble when I was younger and you know, people... Even now, people say, were you proud to play for United? I'm like, a little bit now. But at the time, I was just, I, I, I suppose I was a bit of a perfectionist. I was a bit, I, I could never really give myself the credit, you know. And I think it's important that people sometimes give themselves credit. It doesn't mean you have to be arrogant about things. And um, you can be, you know, quietly, quietly, um, generous to yourself and I don't think I really was when I was there I, I, kind of looking back now because I'm writing a book about, about the experience at the moment and yeah, you, you, it's, I still find it difficult to be completely proud of myself, it's weird I think um, if, if, you, if it's like me, I mean you, you do stories about you know, staying out till super late and getting dragged into the house kicking a ball around the garden and up the local fields I was exactly the same as that mm. and I think it's because you just, it's just normal to you, it's what you do yeah. You don't you don't feel odd doing it, and and whether you're kicking about with your mates down the park or another another challenge is when you get older, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and then you, you're not able to play with your mates because you're training, yeah. you know, three four times a week. You're having to rest, you know, you're almost being um, bred as a professional from a young age, aren't you? That you have to detach from your friends. That's before you even move yeah. away to do into your digs at sixteen. Um, but I think it's, it's it's just because it normalizes it, doesn't it? You know, and and, and you're in that environment because that's what they do, and I think that's why success breeds success quite often. And when people are saying, you know, well, well done, you've got, you know, you're under 15, under 16, under 18 Welsh cap, which I know we both got. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's just part. That's what people that I bother with do. And I think that's where you know when you get into that personal development journey and you start understanding that actually the premises around you can look around the five people you spend most of your time with and you'll become the average of them. Yeah, that's the environment we were in, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I, but I'd say as well, you know, you say about the five people you you hang around with. I think nowadays you can hang around, you can connect with people who are really resonate with you. Like like you reached out to me. Um, back in the day, sometimes I'd feel a bit lonely because I was interested in personal development and stuff. Even then, you know, I had a, I was fascinated by the workings of the mind and what what separates people. You know, I'd look at some of players I grew up with who were who were really gifted um, I remember probably your year it was a guy called Leon Jean he was at Cardiff wasn't he he was like really gifted he was like you, you heard about him when he was younger but he knew he came from a very troubled background and and maybe didn't know how, how to be disciplined and it's a weird weird thing really but um, yeah it's, it's, it's always fascinating me but like you said when we were younger and it wasn't a decision to play football. It was just innate in you. And I always, I always say, you know, when people say, I'm, I should do this, I should do that, I should be going to the gym, I should be on that. If you're asking yourself, if, you, if you're having to force yourself to do stuff, you have to really question, is a desire deep enough in you to do that thing? Um, that's what I always think, you know, because I, I think if you, I don't get me wrong, you know, you can procrastinate sometimes. Everyone does to agree now and again, but if you really have to force yourself to do something, you have to really question at a deeper level, what, what, why are you doing that thing? 
I don't yeah. know if that's the same for you. Or, yeah, you and know. I think the word that comes to mind, I mean, we're really fortunate that we're working in the world with elite athletes and, and Olympic champions in it where we're coaching them from a mindset perspective. And the word that comes out regularly is, you know, the sacrifice they have to have. And it's only the word sacrifice from people externally. So, you know, one of our athletes, you know, they, they, they live like a monk. They, you know, they, they didn't have a Christmas, really. You know, they didn't see their family because they were on a tra big training block leading up to, you know, the Tokyo Olympics, which has obviously been slipped now, so that's changed their plans. But it's not sacrifice them, it's just what they have to do to get the end result. So yeah. it's not sacrifice, it's just sheer commitment. Commitment. And sometimes, you know, that's, that's what sometimes I find difficult to see when people judge, judge maybe athletes or elite performers, say, well, they think that they've have been had a god-given talent and they haven't had to work for it but they have had to do those sacrifices it, which which people looking in th would would underestimate but you do you do you do you do, you do sacrifice a lot when when i look back you know you look look back just stuff little stuff like you know when the exchange trips going to france and germany with some of my friends i would never go on those and you have to sacrifice those kind of things but yeah i'm the same as you it doesn't feel like that at the time because the the desire in you is so strong that it kind of um yeah cov covers that basically that's that's how it felt for me um when i grew up it was never a point where i thought oh what when i was you know maybe retrospectively i can look back and think oh maybe i was a bit obsessional yeah, to be honest a lot of elite performers in my experience and up, there's a hint of obsession there. You, you, there's that desire that maybe, you know, people in businesses, do they always think like, oh, that obsession or that desire to sacrifice always equates to just athletes, but you can still have that mindset as a as a business professional. That that's more maybe what benefits you from that sporting background is because you do have that kind of drive that that maybe people sometimes just linked to athletes and elite performers but you can be an elite performer in any line of work really yeah and i think you know going back to one of the things you said earlier regarding you know you, you were naturally talented it probably wasn't the the physical ability to kick a ball and control a ball that was the natural skill it was the ability to dedicate yourself to get better at it you had that natural drive and you'd found almost your calling at a young age so, you know, you could get those, get those deliberate practice that those, those, you know, 10,000 hours, whatever sort of uh, brand of practice you want to put out there, you could start that very, very young because you found it where yeah. I think some people will, will try things out, not quite find their call and they might well be business later on. And that's when it really sort of drives them forward. So doing 16, 18, 20 hour days is not a problem when you're fully dedicated to it. But what you've got to add to that is the ability to work smart and get your yeah. rest and manage your energy levels. Because what the beauty of sport is, is that you'll always have the have ability to get a good night's sleep. You'll have rest and recovery factored into your training program, or certainly more so now than we did in our day. But, um, you know, you know that everything's for a reason. With, with business, business is never ending. You can always do more. That email's always going to come in. That call's yeah. going to be always be made. And I think that's the crossover we try and make within our roles is, yes, we work with elite sports stars and, yes, we work with elite businesses, but you need to learn from one another. So the processes, for example, and, and the way they drill down into statistics within business is hugely, hugely important sport, but they can be rejected for natural talent and, and natural instinct. And I think there's a huge merge there. And it's, super, it's, it's fascinating for us to be in the middle, to see the both sides and be able to communicate to them. I, you know what you said about you know, I was lucky I, I picked up the ball and that was my calling I do believe every individual has got some kind of calling in life I was just lucky that football you're always going to come across a football at the yard or whatever but so what I you know what I'd maybe um, advise any parents and stuff is just to give children different different options different possibilities I, I think there's a book called, out called Range by a guy called David Epstein and he kind of talks about if you, have, you try different things and then you'll naturally veer towards towards something and I just feel I just, sometimes I feel pity over those some people who go through life thinking oh, I'm no good and I can't do anything and it's not a case of that you just maybe haven't stumbled on that one thing that just ignites something deep inside you and then like you said the word sacrifice the word kind of um, discipline doesn't really come into it because you're just living that life yeah, and I can, I can echo it from life experience. So my lad's, um, my lad's 18, and I remember taking him to his first sort of uh, soccer talk session. And obviously, being a football, football mad lad growing up myself, 
I was really excited about it. in the first session. He was like, it's not for me. I don't like it. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that I had the presence of mind going, well, that's fine. It's not for you. Let's take you to something else. And then he went off to karate or rugby. He didn't really fancy that. And then one day he went out with his mates for a kickabout or football. Loved it. Dad, I really like this football. Can I go and give it another go again? And now he's mad. He's playing like non-league, non-league football at 18 and, and absolutely mad for it. And it's a huge crossover for us to have that conversation. He's, he's certainly more mad about it than me. But I could have easily tried to push him at that age, yeah. you know, to yeah. go and do something. And then naturally as humans, we want to resist against that. So yeah. I think that variety, giving them the chance to, to explore things and then let them find the one that they like, you know, whatever that is. And yeah. then let them be passionate about it. Totally agree with that. Yeah, totally. So talk to me more, but a bit more in rich detail then, what, what it was like being at Man United. So, you know, the picture is, you know, you're 16 or so, you've just finished mm. your GCSEs, you have to move up to Manchester. Uh, they normally, in, in my experience, they normally get you some digs, you normally living with yeah, another family, yeah. you're travelling in and out of training every day, you, you know, you, you haven't got a normal sort of working day, you're not even training nine till five because there might be an evening match or there might be yeah. a first team match or a reserve team match. And you, what was it like being in that environment at the time when it was so successful? It's difficult. I think it was about 15 of us who had scholarships that year and you've got a mixture of the local lads and then the, the guys who maybe have to sacrifice. When you say sacrifice, but you do give up a lot more because I had to leave my friends. He had a couple of guys from, from Republic of Ireland. Um, maybe the local lads underestimated that to a degree. They could go and train and then their life hadn't totally changed away from the football. They were still living the same kind of life. Yeah, they were training every day. But for us, it's a big... It's a big thing. I was quite academic in school. I had a close knit um, group of friends, and it's a big call. Not that I was ever gonna. It was ever in the really discussion. Once Man United came in, I was never gonna not take that scholarship. But yeah, you are. You know, I was living with a um, landlord and landlady. Like you say, digs up in Manchester, and you know they they were they were Manchester City supporters actually. So we they they were meant to keep to a strict diet, you know, like pasta and stuff. But they she used to just like go, oh, you, you want some chips and you want all this. <laughs> I think she was trying to sabotage us um, secretly. And I you know she so had that. Um, it was to you know just to start off with my body. What well, had gone from my like, training once twice a week for Cardiff school boys to you know being pulverized every day really pummeled you know with with bleep tests and country runs and all, all kinds of stuff hill sprints um it was quite surreal it was an amazing experience i mean i know we had to do some education as part of the scholarship you had to, to do like a day in um, the local college every week um, day off half the plays yeah college. yeah what did you study we always got given leisure and tourism it yeah, was leisure, quite... yeah well I, I listen i was just i was happened to be one of the more academic boys so you'd have like i think it was two of us two maybe maybe yeah there's just three of us who did like business and finance um i think it was like a b-tech or something but I, I was always a little bit i'll be honest with you i was always a little bit surprised you know it's maybe more of a um, reflection on the on the era rather than you know, reflection on the club but you know we'd have our body fat tested we'd have um we'd have like a card given by the doctor saying what banned substances were for the i don't know if you had the same but then we even had stuff like our vision tested peripheral vision but not any point did we have any psychological kind of um t not testing or any input about you know because it was a big thing you know you're moving i'm moving from home leaving all my family friends which is difficult enough as it is and you're going into this elite fierce environment and at times i felt like i would have benefited from that because but then because it wasn't kind of supplied by the club you just thought well maybe it isn't important even though there was a deep awareness in me that was like that's what probably separates you know a lot a lot of a lot of players i i, I was always um really gifted but i probably did tend to think too much i'd overthink things i was a bit obsessional which it's a fine line, isn't it, between obsession and, and thinking too much and that drive and falling off the edge where it, it can take away from your performance and stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it, was an, it was an amazing experience. But what, what was difficult for me is in my first season, I'd done all this pre-season training. I think we were a week away from the season starting. I had a bad injury. Um, one, of, one of the guys, it wasn't wasn't a foul, you know, he, he just went for the ball, happened to catch my leg and twisted my knee. Um, I'd had like an injury to my other knee when I was um, when I was in school once and the knee had started clicking. I was like, oh, this is very similar. Um, but then 
but then it started settling down i was with the physios a couple of days and then i was like oh well this step at the rehabilitation i even went out, went out running so i thought oh, maybe it wasn't as bad i had a sense when it happens like oh this, this isn't right but then i thought well they, they didn't seem to be overly concerned but i remember i was on the physio bed doing that stretch where you pull your heel up to your to your bum you like a thigh stretch and I left my leg go and I couldn't, my knee was just locked in midair. I was like, I was calling to the physio, I can't move my leg. And then he came over and he's like, yeah, it's, it doesn't look too good. I think what had happened, I'd, I'd tore my cartilage in my knee and it kind of just drifted back into position, but it wasn't, wasn't stable. And just that stretch had just pulled it out. And yeah, I was in a knee brace then for, I think it was eight weeks. It's quite difficult then because you, I was going home in a knee brace and knowing that time had frozen for me in a way and all the other guys were were, were moving ahead, you know. So I, and probably a lot of players who were injured in, in every, um, in any um, event can probably attest to this. If you're not doing that sport, what are you? You suddenly feel a bit like, a bit like, um, a bit of a waste of space really in a little bit, you know, in terms of I was, it was fine, you know, the first time you get out of an injury, you can think, right, you know, this has happened, right, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to strengthen other parts of my body and, you know, look, take the positives and all, all that stuff. So that was great. I, and I came back that first season and my, my form was good and right at the end of the first season. But then the season ended and I was like reaching peak performance and the season had ended. So I thought, all right, I'm going to come back to the second season, going to hit the ground running did the preseason again and my knee broke down again just before the start of the season now I, I'd, I'd imagine a lot of athletes say the, the second the, the, if you have like a, a relapse or something that's more difficult because that's when the doubts start coming in that's when you yeah. start thinking oh, maybe my body isn't designed for this maybe you know I'm, I'm you start doubting yourself massively and that's why I probably would have benefited from maybe a psychotherapist or a psychologist to be able just to reframe things um, to see where the opportunity because I, 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 because to be honest with you the physios that, that that's not their speciality they, they, you no. know they, 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 they're, they're, there's no, no judgment on them but their main premise is to get you physically better to be able to go on the pitch um, there's a difference between asking someone um, how's your knee or how's your injury or, or how do you feel about that injury there's a there's a big difference and and plus because I was an overthinker I thought too much when you're doing those hours alone in rehabilitation you have got the band to the dress and you hear the guys going out to training that's when you start like conjuring up stories that aren't true and you're starting to doubt yourself um, so I was kind of kind of battling with that and then just go to the third season then so at third season I happened to be injury free um and I was having regular meetings with my coach and he'd say yeah it's carry on you know you've you're showing showing your talent and stuff and then I think it was about and 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 it, during the period as well there was a uh, there's a documentary for for Welsh television being they were filming a documentary on me at my time at United and that documentary had gone out over Christmas in February, we were all, it was just unannounced. We'd, all the third years, um, it'd be said, right, Gaffer Ferguson wants to see everyone in his office individually. So I went in thinking, just based on what the coach had said to me, that I, I'm going to get another year. I didn't, I wasn't under any false pretenses. You know, was, the battle to make the first team was, was, still, was still a bit far away. You know, I'd, I'd suffered so much injury that it's very difficult when you've suffered that much injury to, to make it a club like United, but you know when Ferguson said we're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, extend your contract. Then suddenly the the ground just fell beneath my feet. Um, it's a weird thing. I wasn't thinking of myself. I was thinking of how I'd let my family down. How I all those trips because every weekend when I was a kid, I'd be going to different trials, different places, and. And plus, this documentary had gone out over Christmas. I think, oh my! And it, there was an, in this documentary, there was nothing. You know, it was all positive stuff. And of like two months later, this has happened. So I, I just felt, and this is in my head. Like I'd never spoke to my parents or anything about it. I was just conjuring up this story of thinking, oh, I'm no good. I'm good for nothing now. Now, if I'd had maybe someone who could have took me aside and say, no, look at this as an opportunity to go somewhere else, and you can perform somewhere else, but 
just part of me is like I was going on trial to different clubs and but I was still trying to deal with a disappointment too. So I was carrying that this big like you know case around me, like this big I don't know, carrying like a weight on the floor around me. So I happened to have a really good game at a, a club called Rotherham and they signed me on the basis that I was a trial game. It was one of those games where just everything came right and but I remember starting at Rotherham, I was going from the dressing room was full of my mates basically a month before at United to suddenly like a team of adults and strong characters rather than at the time we were in the championship and they'd got two successive promotions so just just goes to show you that they had a strong tight-knit group and they made me feel welcome there's nothing wrong with that but I was still carrying that thought of oh, I've not been good enough and letting people down I hadn't really dealt with that so yeah it would have been great for me to to maybe paint that, you know, the next chapter of me going to rather than proving Fergie wrong. But with the mindset I had on the time, that wasn't going to happen. And my knee started flaring up again and it just just kind of spiralled from there, really. I think there's a couple of bits in there that sort of resonated. Yeah. And I think it's that that moment of sheer rejection, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, rejection and also um, questioning your identity. Yeah. Um, and, and, then, and then subconsciously you start questioning everything you knew about yourself. You know, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm an half decent footballer. I'm doing well. This is my calling. This is what I'm going to be doing. To so now one person's decision, you know, and it normally does come down to one people, person, the senior, first team manager, to make that call. Yeah. Make that call and the effect it has on people. And it's always been a concern of mine. I've had, had a conversation just with my own experience that I can't believe there's no support from people, from the FA, for example, or the PFA for the thousands of kids that go through what we did at yeah. that time at the age of 19 you're very vulnerable uh, you're impressionable you yeah. can easily fall off the system you can fall out of the system and more likely with the right approach you can actually get back into it so we talk about the lack of yeah. grassroots football getting into the british football system in a minute it's because we're letting all the talent go yeah. you know the first team are going out buying multi-million pound players but you've got some fantastic talent that maybe have not quite matured yet that especially when you're starting off at a high club like yourself you know the, high, the number one club in the uk any other club would have probably had a look at you, you know, realistically, if you were in the right frame of mind. Yeah. Even if it was a championship or a League One team. And then setting you up for success. So give you a couple of seasons there, you know, let you mature, strengthen into the adult football, because it is a different game, isn't it? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you've got a chance of bouncing back. But the amount of people that bounce back after rejection is minimal. Minimal. Yeah. You know, there's a couple, I know Jamie Vardy's did it, and a couple of other footballers. But that, that's not right. And it's, it's because... A, go on. Yes. Sorry. It's a matter of luck, maybe. You know, the, I... I'd say there's like like you allude to. There's probably more people who. I, it's not even on football basis. I, I always think like someone whose identity has been wrapped up so much in football, and they're basically once they've been rejected by a club, they, they they that belief of I'm not good enough. Now that prevents them from maybe excelling in other areas of their life. You know, it, it's not just the fact that, oh, well, it, it takes away from your football career. It's the knock-on effect of how society misses out. Because a lot of that drive and determination that people have got to even reach a level that I did and you did before we got, um, you know, released or whatever, it, it just shows a lot of um, character qualities. And that can be transferred to other areas of life but I just feel pity on those who may be gone through life still carrying that thought of not being good enough based on that cut long story short I was, uh, I was speaking to someone um, recently um, he'd been released by a well known ex in England international Okay, and not only did the guy say um, you're not good enough for this club he said you're not going to mount anything now for me that that's that's veering on abuse in a way. It's a, it's a it's a form of mental abuse. I mean, he might as well have just stood up and just punched the guy in the face. I, I I just think that that's the thing with sometimes with football. Like you said, you play for hours as a kid, and same as me. Your identity is being built subconsciously on something external to you, which is football, and suddenly you realise people have been rejected and it's like a house of cards your, your foundation's gone and that's the point where you need someone to come in and like you say reframe things and not even that just to just just make you see things differently and maybe just tap into that void that the, that football once that's gone leaves in your life I mean I, I'd gone to Rotherham and 
there, there was an opportunity. They were in the championship. It was only a division below the Premiership, but for me, it was just a world away from United. Um, I knew I knew quite immediately that it wasn't the right club for me, but I just didn't have an agent at the time. Didn't have any any kind of support. Didn't want really want to worry my mum and dad, who were already worried for me, you know, from leaving Man U and. 1920 being up in Rotherham so I didn't really I didn't really talk to someone um I, I, it shows you how people maybe neglect the, the the mental side of of performance and 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 well-being is in my, I knew I wasn't I wasn't doing well I, I knew mentally I something not right so when my I was there for two seasons in my second season the pre-season beforehand I was just going to the gym every day and just pummeling myself you know just just like hammering myself I thought if I just get fit enough if I just get physically fit enough I'll be okay so you know I went back to Rotherham and I remember we did a bleed test on the first day back and I smashed it smashed the record for the bleed test there I was like I was flying but I hadn't dealt with the mental side of things I just thought if I get fit I get fitter that'll just cover up any any psychological um feeling of lack I had and suddenly you know I was away from home again then suddenly that starts seeping in and then I was like I, I hadn't dealt with that, that the stuff from United I still hadn't really dealt with things so I was still carrying that around so and my knee started playing up but the, the thing is that with my knee that that's what ultimately I had to retire from my lack of mental fitness or ability to access mental skills at the time probably has had a deeper impact on my life because end of the day, you know, with my knee now, it, yeah, you feel it now and again, but it, I don't carry, you, you, you carry your mind around every, every, see everything in life through the filter of your own mind. If, you, if that's not working for you, it doesn't matter. You can get, uh, and it's, I think we do leave something in the culture where you can, you know, when you go to the gym, I mean, you go back to probably, you know probably over 100 years ago people going to the gym and working on the muscles people thinking what the hell are you doing? What, what's that all about but it's been normalized in that culture but the thing is with the mental side it's more subtle more nuanced isn't it because you can go to the gym and you can see your muscles getting bigger but that, that's what I found and it basically it culminated with me asking to see my manager my manager was fine he, bit old school we didn't really have any any there was a guy called Ronnie Moore we didn't have any he probably didn't know much about what my life was for off off the pitch um and I just asked to see him one day and he's probably thinking oh he's gonna have a go at me for not I'm not in the first team right and then yeah, that's what what you probably expect that's what probably half the conversations he had with players were at that time you know if someone's on the bench you know he, you know what footballers are like most insecure kind of breed really you know they built their identity on being in that 11 every, every week but I literally went in and went strip up my contract and I was like I was 20 21 still had six seven months left on my contract so effectively I was in don't forget about that money. I don't care about money because they weren't. Once I've said I want to rip up my contract, they're not obliged to give me anything. And he, I think he was a bit shocked, really, because he probably has never had someone say that to him. Um, but I just, I, but I was just lucky that I was. I've always had that maybe deeper awareness that when I, when things have got really dark, you know, I was basically living in a flat at the time. I'd go back. I'd after training I just shut my curtains and just wait for the next day and I, I'm lucky I've never really been pulled towards alcohol probably my addiction has been thinking too much but underneath that there just there was that awareness thinking you've got to do something about this and for me the money was irrelevant um, I just needed to go back home probably to surround myself with people you know my tribe really um, my family and my friends and but that's going to show you you think about how much I'd worked at football you know it was my dream you know that first school report when I was five best luck with football and it ended like that with me saying rip up my contract I mean what what happened then is I started I went to uni to study a business degree and I was playing semi-professionally and suddenly I got the enjoyment back for for life you know for football but that, that's what I'm saying I, the, the football it, my knee was still deteriorating um so there's no slowing that process down and what happened is i was 24 25 
and my knee, I'd play football one weekend and one Saturday, and the following Saturday, I was still trying to get the swelling down from the previous Saturday. I was thinking, oh, this isn't great. So um, I went to see the physio then. Um, the, not the physio, the consultant. And he basically said, Rodri, you've got the knee of a 50-year-old ex-footballer at 24. So then you, then, then the penny kind of drops. That, you know, the football's got to go. And suddenly you've got that void is big then because I didn't even have that release of just playing semi-professionally. And not only I probably hadn't, I probably still hadn't dealt with that even, and this is me, you know, five years later from Ferguson releasing me, but I'm still probably carrying that feeling of not being good enough. But added to that now, when the consultant said, Rod, you've got an even fifth year old ex-footballer 24, he might as well have just said to me, um, Rod, you're worthless. That that's the way my mind heard it. So I was kind of around feelings of being not good enough and worthless. So, but then that drive and discipline and that you know, like you, same as yourself, you come from that background of performance. Well, I managed to I've managed to cultivate a you know career in the filmmaking industry as a documentary and drama director and producer. But it's probably still been built of trying to prove that I'm good enough and and that I'm worthy. And so I've, it's not come from a place of freedom. I've still been doing it to prove that I'm worthy. But underneath that, there's probably still been that feeling of I'm trying to basically what what I've probably been doing is trying to build something external to me. Just if if I just do if I just Get get a um, successful TV industry. That's going to paper over the cracks. Well, I think unless you unless you tackle issues that are deeper inside you, then you're not going to get that freedom from external achievements. Now, what I now what I've start tried to do is, well, work on work on myself first. It doesn't mean you have to retreat from the world like a hermit, but you, you still succeed. But you're not you, you you're bringing a different relationship to it. You're not you're not placing as much of your identity to external stuff like I probably did with football and and following. I, I that that that's that's been my probably biggest learning. And yeah, yeah, amazing. I I, I could have listened to that all day to be honest, with you, Roger, in terms of the journey because not only is it you know it's raw and powerful, but it's it's so common, isn't it? You know, and, and just a whistle stop through that. It's not just about, you know, you that have experienced this. I was, I was 19. Um, we, it was, it was our last season. Um, it was end of April when we got pulled in and it was, and we couldn't make sense of it because we got told we were going to be told in February whether we we're going to get signed on or not. And our last year, um, last year team had been whittled down to seven. To, there's only four of us left anyway. And um, it, it'd been going really well, really well, actually. The second season, I'd had a, had a storming season. I'd already played for the first team. Um, I, 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 was a, I played every single reserve team game. I think I was top goal scorer for the reserve team from a winger, which was unusual. So the signs were all there that you, you got half a chance. Yeah. And then, but you never know, do you? You never know. So I remember it was, one of those, um, it was one of those apprenticeship education days, actually, which we did on site. And uh, the youth team manager had uh, come up. It was Colin Pascoe, the ex-Welsh international, come up and said... Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, Gaffer, Frankie Burrows, first team manager, wants to see the, the last year pro, uh, last year guys, and they want to see you in this order. And I was last. So all the first team and second year, first year and second year were like, Phil, you're in like, you know, if you're going in last, it's because he's been off for at least a year. You, this, this is a no brainer. Yeah. First lad goes in, right, it's a no. Second lad goes in, no, it's a no. Third lad goes in, oh, it's a month month contract. You know, they're going to play it as it goes, see how it goes through the summer. And I was like, oh, did you accept it? And he went, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll be back in June. We'll have a pre-season and we'll see how it goes. So I was walking down thinking, hmm, well, hopefully I'll just get that. You know, if I get that, I'll be happy. Yeah, Anything yeah. more than that's great. Walked in. Sorry, lad. You know, going to have to let you go. And I don't know if it about, about you, Rodri, but that moment where he said it, I can still remember it. And the way I describe it, it's a bit like a scene from The Sopranos where he was in a leather chair in the manager's office, first team office, obviously. And I was stood at the side of the desk, a naughty school kid. And he's just talking at me. And once he says, we're going to have to let you go, he keeps talking. I'm like, can't hear a word he's saying. Yeah. You know, it's almost like a little bit of shock. Not shock from ego thinking I was expecting it, but shock of reality, is it? And when you say about, you know, knowing yourself in a moment, just to explain to the listeners out there, what happens is with us is you literally have to walk out of the manager's office, yeah. go and get your boots, yeah. get your kit bag, and leave the stadium as if you've been sacked. 
we had to leave there and then. So oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. That that moment, oh, it was almost uh, not not as far as being escorted out of the building. I went up back up into the classroom, got my bags, and they were like, "Yeah, you're free to leave." So I went down, grabbed my kit bag, grabbed my boots, and the other three guys, two of them kicked off, fuming as you can imagine, total mm. emotional response. One of the lads yeah. was, was really quiet and placid anyway. And this is this is the one thing I remember, and it's probably one of the most proudest proudest moments of my life is that. I went back downstairs into the main hallway where the exit door was, and you turn right to the door to leave. And I turned left, and I went to the, the, the coach's office. Now, the, obviously, in there, you have the reserve team manager, the youth team academy, the, the rest of the academy coaches in there. And they were all in there, and they looked. They went, Phil, you all right? They obviously knew what had happened. And I went, yeah, I've just come to say thank you very much for everything you've done for me over the last nine years. You know, nine years I'd been there. And uh, the, the, this, the, the reserve team manager said, come here, and he put his big arm around me. Mm-hmm. And I always remember, there's a big um, lad called Billy Air. I don't remember right, he was a Geordie lad, and he, played, he had, had his playing career at Blackpool. What a lovely guy. And I put his arm around me, he went, you come in with me, and he walked me out onto the pitch. And we sat in the dugout, and we just chat for 10 minutes. And he said something like, and, and this is the words I remember after, is like, we've been arguing for weeks and months with him that we need to sign you. You need to remember that. But the first team got promoted on the Saturday. This is now the Tuesday. So they're going to go out and buy more established players. So and within 48 hours, they announced they bought somebody from Fulham in my position for half a million quid. You can't compete with that, you know, a, a 28-year-old established Premier League player. So yeah. having that context was really, really important. And for that father-like figure to put his arm around me and have some time for me and say, this is like, we fought for you. We couldn't get you in. You wouldn't have it. It's his decision, but we stand by it. But just remember the fact that what you've just done, you've just come into that that office and said thank you to all the coaches you remember what you've just done from a personal perspective and a value perspective no um yeah so whilst my whole world got turned upside down um i do look back at that way i responded quite fondly Um, my journey was very similar to yours but i also talk you talked about your tribe and having those people to support you Mm. i was fortunate enough that i was close to home yeah um and I actually went for the next couple of months, I went and played rugby with all my mates for the local rugby team again. Oh, I hadn't yeah, played yeah. in donkey's years. And I was the typical footballer playing rugby as well. Um, <laughs> and, and I did things I probably didn't do before. You know, I'd go out and have a beer on yeah, a Saturday yeah. night and just let my hair down and have fun with the boys. And that sort of helped cope with it. But what I would say is it wasn't until I was 25 until I told anybody about what happened. So that um, bit where you were saying four or five years, yeah, it was six years where the first time I really spoke up about it. Because it scars you, doesn't it? It did. I mean, you know, I think with me as well, because I'd, I'd been a massive Man U fan since I was five, and Ferguson had been there since 86, so he was like the, the godfather, really, in United. So, one, he was one of those people, to be honest, that was partially success. He'd, he'd know everyone's name, you know, so he'd walk, walk past the corridor, he'd ask how you are, how's the family. But then I'd never been to his office, so it's a bit daunting for a 19-year-old just to be even going to his office. I was a little bit like going in, just trying to see what memorabilia he had around in his office. But then, what, what, come, those, I know what he was trying to do, because when we signed as a schoolboy, we signed with him, and he was trying to take responsibility as well. He felt responsible for us, even though on a day-to-day basis, I didn't have any dealings with him. He felt like it was his responsibility to t- let you know what your future is at the club. But honestly, the words coming for him, the, the, the fall was much harder than it would be if just my coach had pulled me to the side and go, listen, you know, you know you're not going to have a new contract. I would have found it easier to deal with. But honestly, when he said to me, my, same as you, my mouth just went dry. I was like, you know, the, I, could, I could feel, uh, I did feel shocked. And honestly, my main thought was don't cry in front of him. I don't want to ask Ferguson to see you cry in front of him. Um, I was the same as you. I, I, I've i never been someone to throw my toys out the pram. I was never going to argue my case. I just said thank you through my <laughs> through my dry lips and and then shut the door and then started crying and what maybe the only difference was with me and you is I didn't leave that day I we I literally went back into the room where like a three or four I think yeah three or four of the guys had found out their new contract so I'm crying while they're inside a joyful because they've had new contracts and I didn't have anyone who took me to to this to the side and it, it was it was kind of left I was left to fend for myself I think we even went out training that day I I, th- I think the reason they told us maybe in February 
was to give us time to find a new club for the next season. But psychologically, that's very difficult because up until then, I'd, I'd, I think I'd been on the, the bench for the reserves, United's reserves. I think I'd been benched a few times. And then suddenly after that, they start, I started playing for the reserves. I was thinking, mentally, I was thinking, oh, maybe I've still, maybe I'll change your mind here. Because why would they, why would I, why would I progress? What's the point progressing me through if I've got no future there? Um, and I remember it was Mike Phelan, who's Solskjaer's assistant now. He was a reserve manager at the time. And I remember him coming up to me after the game, and after one game, I think we played Aston Villa, and he said, play like that, you have no problem at all. So I was like, I went away thinking, even though I was going on trial to other clubs, you know, in the meantime, now and again, I thought, are they going to change? They might change their mind here. So honestly, up until the last day and I did, I thought they're going to change their mind. So even though I was told in February and then I, I started in Rotherham in July, well, I think the end of the season was June. So up until probably June, I still thought United might change their mind but just because I was still training every day. I just think maybe it's a sign of the times that people maybe didn't realise the psychological impact, especially for young guys. Your brain's still maturing till you're about 21. You know, you you're still physically are still developing. You're not, you're still maturing as a person. So you can those psychological impacts are probably going to be deeper at that young age. And then maybe I, you know, I think as you get older, you probably just get more set in your ways. Your neural pathways go down the same route every day, unless unless you decide to do something different. But back then, I was. I just couldn't understand it really and it was it was a bit it was a bit strange and obviously because I'm writing this book I'm looking back at things it's it's weird um but um, yeah it was a testament to maybe maybe that chat that you had with that guy just and that you were able to be at home it just you you, you maybe could go back to normality or that, whereas I was maybe I was up in north of England by myself and kind of um um bit clueless yeah, really. and, and a little bit on your own as well aren't you because you know yeah. when, when you are with a club a lot of stuff's done for you isn't it, even at a young age because they've they got to do that because they've got to compete with the other clubs to keep you as a youngster and they entice you in don't they you know yeah. and i think the pros and cons for it, cause i also remember people challenging me you know going back to my my home my hometown and, and people going oh there you are you know there you are going off to the football club thinking you're the big i am and now look oh, at you really? just the same so, yeah i had a lot of that a lot oh, of people on top of me um wasn't friends or well, clearly you know they wouldn't have had that but, yeah yeah and, and i wasn't the, certainly wasn't like people to give it you know the barry big bananas walking around town look at me in my tracksuit type of thing yeah, i was never yeah. never like that but yeah people as, as you know you know you, you see it with people on time they, they, they build you up to knock you down and when you do knock down they'll kick you down even quicker and that's a that's an even bigger fall from grace isn't it you know where it's quite difficult but yeah what what's um what i'm seeing um certainly less you know in sport and in business is that they're slowly not quick enough for me, and, and I don't mean that from a business perspective. Because what we do is they they're not they're not fully getting the importance of mental fitness and mental well being, yeah. and, and the yeah. importance of that on performance. So I know that you know that the likes of the FA and the, the PFA and all that have got loads of psychologists now. They're all in and out the organisation. They're in the England FA. So, but you're not looking at it from the player's point of view. If you said to a player, go and speak to a psychologist, they'd say, there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah, yeah. The psychologist yeah. and the therapist is, but there's nothing wrong with me. And sometimes there's not nothing wrong with you. You just haven't got clarity on what's going on. Yeah. So this is where I think, you know, the likes of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team are really forward thinking, where they've got experienced players within the team that are classed as mental skills coaches. So they're yeah. basically a first step, a first point of contact where you go, I'm not feeling it today. Can we have a quick chat and have a coffee later or whatever? You know what I mean? And you have that chat and then they go, right, we'll try and work through it. But if there's nothing else, I'll just signpost you. I think you need to go have a chat with the doc or uh, I think you need yeah. to have a chat with the therapist or the psychologist as a filter. Um, but I, I, I think they're not getting it because they're too focused on the outcome. They need to be winning games. Yeah. And if we've got a pool of 60 players and three or four fall off, then so be it. It's just, you know, rate of attrition. And it's not just football, by the way. It's across yeah. other sports. Um, so a lot of our athletes say we're their safety net, where they're in their bubble of their own sporting um, field, if you like, which has got psychologists, et cetera. But the last thing they want to do is go and speak to the psychologist who might speak to the coach who's, impo- who's, who's picking the team. Yeah. Because the psychologist yeah, has yeah. got a duty of care to say, well, actually, you know, Reese isn't feeling too good at the minute, so I'd probably suggest he doesn't play on Saturday. Where a mental skills coach who's maybe been there and done it will say, well, actually, the best thing you can do is actually play him on Saturday. Yeah. You yeah. know, you know what's, what's your thoughts on that? 
It's funny you talk about the New Zealand team um, after the, the last Rugby World Cup. I remember they, they got battered by England in there. I can't remember if it was the quarters or the semis. And I remember um, in the press conference after the questions were going on, oh, did you have a bit, you know, did you go through the performance afterwards? Or was there a bit of an inquest in the dressing room? And Steve Hansen just went, no, no, no. But first and foremost, it's a big emotional fall for those guys. They've been training for so long in New Zealand. They expected to win. First boys are just checking in with each other just checking that everyone's okay there's people crying that's not the time to talk about performance yes to to be honest it's looking at at the person instead of the athlete at at times like those because that's what the thing athletes are human so suddenly sometimes you know when when i watch football games now i'll watch someone maybe hasn't done that run or done that pass or he's miscontrolled the ball it might not be the fact that he hasn't um it, it could be fact yeah that maybe He's having a tough time at home or, or something and he's not been able to um, separate home life from performance and stuff. But that was telling me from the All Blacks that he could have turned on and said, yeah, we had a grilling and everyone, that we didn't, we didn't hit these statistics during the game. But no, he was going like on the human level, first and foremost, is check that everyone's okay. And I, I think, honestly, for me, performance-wise, you, if you get um, your players happy, um, if you get, you know, make sure people's well-being, right? And then as a foundation, and yeah, you can add models or whatever, and you know, performance aspects to, to things. But I, for me, uh, when I when I played my best is when I felt free, when I felt, you know, happy. And in a way, it was um, it's clearing obstacles out of your way rather than adding too much to it. Um, and I, I just feel maybe. You, you see, I, I think the PFA have got a um, well-being um, department, and they, I think they've announced that there was like record numbers of, of players that contacted them last year saying that they're suffering from personal problems or whatever it was. And my my reaction is, oh, that's great that players are not suffering in silence, maybe like I did. But what's the root of that issue? You know, if you don't go to the root of anything, then. You, you, you can swap external things in your life, but you're still not free. And I, I do think, for me, my my best performance came when I felt free, where I, where you know, um, but at the times where where my mind was working against me, that's when you just just need someone to not. It's not about yeah, like I I, I think maybe psychologists do get you know, a bad rap sometimes because I think do more and more psychologists are, are combining performance and well-being. But for us at the time, there wasn't that. Um, but also, you have to take account for yourself as well. I, I mean, I think I was always took took account for, for what I was doing. I was a, I always held myself accountable. But the problem with me, I wasn't gentle with, with myself. I, I remember cl- um, hearing Clark Carlisle talk in the podcast, and obviously he was a guy who was very intelligent, had a successful career in football, and he tried tried to take his own life. And he was just, just trying to describe the feelings that went through his head when, um, you know, leading up to to him taking his own life and he and I could relate in terms of what he said imagine every day waking up I'd be playing a reserve game in the night or something and all day I'd have that voice in my head going you're not good enough you're good enough you're useless use all day it's just pounding at your head so so sometimes you you just want to escape from your own head um and unfortunately uh, a lot of people take that route out but there's always I've had those dark thoughts but I've always been I've always been lucky to have that awareness I've never acted upon any dark thoughts um I've always had that curiosity to find out um what what's going on and that's why I meditate and stuff because it just that moment of stillness you can see oh that that thought that can you're going to get if you don't jump on it and like feed it it kind of goes you, you get, and yeah there's obviously stuff you can do to reframe situ- situations and stuff but i think reframe when you're down in the depth reframing is quite difficult because when you got, when you got like that's why i always you know my main thing now is prevention is better than cure but unfortunately sometimes we live in a culture where we're like oh, hit the wall first before we do something about it and it's like well no i mean did physically do you wait until you're obese before you start and um, working on your physical yeah. fitness I, and i do think 
it has to be a cultural shift and obviously we're, we're having this conversation during the time of coronavirus and that might sometimes people don't change or, or look at changing their life until they hit crisis and this is a societal crisis that we're in the middle of i know this this talk will probably go out later but it'd be interesting to see if you know maybe it is, uh, we're, we're living in a period where people will actually um work on their uh, on their inner lives a little bit more um, rather than rather than um, yeah and then there's you know. there's a there's a few things again jumping out as you're chatting there that um you know, one of the biggest frauds I think we have as human beings that we think all our faults are real. Mm. You know, we, we, we yeah. can't, kind of because when you're in the, that deep, dark moment, you're not going to think logically, you're going to think completely irrationally. Your, yeah. your, inter, your internal dialogue, that inner voice that we've all got, just goes from a, a three to a ten, yeah. you know, and those, 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 those voices are just playing on your beliefs and they just re-emphasize them. And when you're trying to go to sleep at night, they're playing through every scenario, which always finish negative. So yeah. it confirms your negative and your low self-worth. But it goes back to that premise of, well, actually, your thoughts are not real unless you act on them, you know? So yeah. let's deal with them. Is that true? Is it not? And then we can work our back end. Um, I also think there's a bit around that performance bit, around checking in with the human bit. And, and that's a lot of advice we're giving our organizations and, and clients at the minute from a corporate perspective of check in with your staff. Just pick the phone up and go, hey, how are you doing? How are you adjusting to working from home? How's things with the family? You know, can we yeah. do anything to support you? Not... Where's the KPIs? Where are you getting up to with that project? Have you rung them yet? Why haven't you done that? That doesn't yeah, matter yeah. right now because, you know, we're only just coming into two weeks into this lockdown. People within the first week were, were scared and unworried and trying to, to sort of settle down into a working pattern and a working environment. And this week is just starting to normalize a little bit. So, you know, we're having, every conversation I'm having is, right, who have you spoke to from your work this week that wasn't about work? You know, who's, who's your closest allies? Because what I will assure people, and this is maybe a lesson from us from our football days, is that people will remember the way you make, make them feel when you're up against it. Yeah. You know, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, people will, will make you, so it's for organizations and leaders and managers, people will remember how you make them feel right now and what you do to help and support them. And, they'll, and, and if it's positive, they will repay it back tenfold, if not a hundredfold. If it's a negative, I don't care, I'm all about the bottom line then expect a huge exit through the door when this is over because they'll want to go and work for their calling or for an organisation that's aligned to their personal values. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's easy to live, it's easy to say, oh, these are our values when things are going well and everything's going well. It's easy, life's easy like that, but it's times of adversity that people maybe show their true colours and show may, maybe where they're lacking in certain areas. I, like you said, it's important that, um, that people, employers and businesses talk to the staff in terms of being open to that conversation it's important as well that people who are suffering don't suffer in silence just i know it's a bit of a cliche everyone says our oh, talking is important but what, what talking allows you is um you realize that the stigma that you carry is usually within yourself if if you verbalize everything you said to yourself and and, and pretended there was a friend saying that to you, you tell the friend where to go. And sometimes I, I always say, even if you just went to, went to stood by a wall and just verbalized everything you felt to the wall, you would feel a little bit better because you, it's going out of your own head. Now it's even more empowering if you can speak to someone who listens and has been able to maybe just cut through something or go, can give you some advice or, or just some, some experiential understanding. Now, Honestly, like you said, that if, if, if I had that realisation, you're not your thoughts or um, that kind of side a while ago, I would have, I would, I've always been quite open-minded about things, always been curious about, oh, right, okay, well, when I meditate, you, oh, yeah, you can see that they come and go. And then you're like, and like you said about what you said about, that's a being big thing for me, what is true in every situation? Now, let's roll back to when Ferguson released me. All he said was, Rodri, you're not getting a contract with Manu. That's the only truth. That is a truth. Now, me saying I'm not good enough, I've let my family down, I've let let my friends down, oh, my, my life's over, or, you know, nothing's going to match this, then that is a story. Now, I'm quite, I have to be, you know, I'll go through a day now, stuff happens, I can get, I can look at it quite analytically, say, what's the truth in this situation? And if you just deal with the truth, then you... And then you start looking how much your mind will automatically label stuff or add concepts. And, and if you strip that away, 
it can be quite freeing because you're taking away you're taking yourself away from things and you 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 um those st- those mental patterns you've gone through that maybe served you well maybe when you were a child you know because when you're a child you're still learning your way through the world and you have to adapt use some of these um ways of thinking t- to go through childhood but those things that saved you in childhood probably don't save you as well they're holding you back as you get older and stuff um it's, it's been one of those things really i probably the same self-driving determination i had when i was younger i probably bought into just trying to understand myself but i can understand myself not from an obsessional point of view now from a place of ex- I, I, i've kind of learned to accept everything now when i say that it doesn't mean a passive giving up but accept things good or bad in terms of right yeah if something that, that i feel like maybe what can i change about this situation but i don't then um try and resist because I, I don't know who said it i know it's a bit of a cliche bit of a slogan but they, they do say what what resists persists and in my case there probably has been that it's been kind of when i've had those dark periods and gone oh you, why are you feeling like this and you, you, you're trying you're trying too hard to um try and solve things all the time and sometimes you kind of just got to take a step back um and and look at the bigger picture um that that's that's just been some of my understanding but everyone's different i'm, I'm never someone who prescribe any anything to anyone because i always feel like everyone's carrying different experiences in life yeah there's general um stuff that's probably quite um common to every human experience but i do feel but what what can be helpful if someone's got an experiential understanding like we resonate with each other because we we share the same story when when people talk the, the people i can talk to about being released from football are only people like yourself people who, who really understand there was another guy to live with the united he got released as well and you know we wish he's a football agent now and he we, we he just gets it when i speak about it he, 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 because it's difficult maybe for some other, some people who are listening to that because they haven't been in that situation but they might be in a different situation but they might have a disappointment elsewhere but maybe they can take some of that feeling but in terms of just the specific football side of things it's probably maybe athletes and other footballers who maybe can really resonate with, with that. yeah and i think so and i think you know the conversation has been a really good insight i think for those that are listening that maybe have got kids that are playing football now you know or yeah. you know you know football being the biggest sport in the uk well in the world um, that, that, that they can resonate that what happens behind closed doors, you know, where it's actually like that it is a brutal sport and this is what can happen. Yeah. Um, but what's great for me is, you know, listening to someone like yourself that um, has, has come out of it. You've had your dark days. You've, you've, you've come out of it in such a positive place. Now you've got a lovely family. You know, this is, this obviously, and I don't know if you know this, you mention it regularly, you know, it's a massive passion of yours and rightly so that you've got things to focus on. You've got a fantastic career you're passionate about positively influencing as many people as you possibly can with your speaking. Um, and obviously you're doing a lot of work with the schools, et cetera. So when you look back, you know, if you go forward many, many years when you're on your deathbed, you look back and you go, well, actually that sport, small part of my life relatively yeah. was a big dip, but it was my biggest learning curve. And look what I've done for the next 40 years. Look how many yeah. people I've positively influenced and, and, you know, doing things like this is a massive part of that. Yeah, I think so. That, that's why sometimes, you know, you talk about reframing, sometimes i'll think about like you said when you look back when you're on your deathbed look back what will you what would you truly value through your life and then it cuts through like a lot of the stuff that you're just worrying about that they're not relevant as grand scheme things always moments where people pass in in your life it does give you a chance to reflect but for a lot of people they reflect for like an hour and then they just go back to how things yeah, were but yeah. for me it's always been that that feeling of listen you you know for me it's family friends and and trying to be of service um and for me it's a big thing for me is when i get to the end of my life i don't i want to live my life not someone else's not thinking oh, i've got to be um pleasing other people all the time and 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 living up to what people expect of me which i probably did for a while um because then the end of the day when all said and done it's, it's it's only your own judgment that matters um 
people are <laughs> you like to think you'll be remembered forever after you go, but people move on, then they carry on uh, their lives. Yeah, so. whether whether you know you talked about earlier regarding rejection, you know, and people could be rejected from you know a job interview or you know being being rejected when you get asked out for a date. Although that's slightly different these days, you know, with the apps on phones and stuff. But um, yeah, the, the rejection comes in in many guises, doesn't it? And 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 I think a lot of the things you were talking about there and how you how you coped with it will, will certainly resonate and help some people out there that are maybe going through a, a difficult patch and. Yeah, looking back, I think, and, and, and it's the stuff that, that really matters is the most important things to concentrate on. You know, your health, your family, friends, uh, your support networks, you know, be, be, a good, be a good citizen, I think, and also being a good professional person on whatever your body of knowledge is. And, and, and good can be, I just go in, I do nine till five, I do the best I can, and then I switch off and I go home and I'm happy. That's the yeah. form of success. It doesn't have to be, well, I'm, I'm busy because I work 16 hours a day and I, I'm, I'm a real career-driven person, which is fantastic and admirable in itself. But it all depends about what you're after and who you are as a person. And I think yeah. that comes out that through all of this, you've found out who you truly are, what you're good at, what, you, what your trip falls are, you know, what you need to be careful yeah. of when that yeah. negative internal dialogue and checking and challenging if it's true. Um, and, then, and then turning that into a way of moving forward to influence people. So with that, What's the future hold then? You've already alluded to that the, the, you're writing a book. Uh, and you did say when we were chatting before that that's got a quite an emotional connection in terms of, I think it was your granddad, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a, it was a weird thing. People, people sometimes think, why are you writing a book now? And, and why, why have you been so open about um, your struggles now? Why, why so long? And one, probably I'm mature enough in terms of, you know, sometimes time goes, you can look back things without maybe the same emotional charge. But the scout who took me to United, died at the end of um, the start of last year which would be 2019 so Ferguson was there at the funeral and I was like it, it just brought up a few memories at the same time my, my granddad um, passed and my granddad was an author um, and I'd, I'd, I've always liked writing and I thought oh but I probably always thought oh, people always think Oh, my story's not that interesting. You people not automatically do you downplay how you know, when someone says like, "Oh, I've been inspired by your story," I like I do I. It's not for me. You always think your your story's not inspirational. That, that's the way I've always felt. I just like oh, I'm just like a normal guy, and you know I've, I've managed to do these things. But but then, then oh my god, I was thinking, well, yeah, I, you know what? I'm going to try because I like writing. And and he he passed, and he was an, he was an author, and I. You know the the publishing company showed an interest, but for me, yeah, I enjoy the process of writing and stuff. But but when my when my grandfather passed, um, I took a few things from his house. My dad my, and my dad asked me, "What well, what do you want?" And I said, "Well, no, I just want to take the books from his books that he had in his um his bookshelf and put them on mine." And it wasn't it was only like a cheap clock, but in his living room he had a clock, and it was always quite like. I always remember the ticking of that clock when I went over. It was just like some stillness. You know, when you're like a bit fraught and stuff and you go over and I was like, and it just always likes to calm me. So I put that in my living room and I tend to write in my living room. So it's just a reminder. And honestly, you know, yeah, it, it, it's part of your head thinking, oh yeah, this book's going to change the world and it comes out well. It's in Welsh. There's only, there's only so many people who speak Welsh. But, um, and you know, so how, how much is going to sell? But, but for me, that's irrelevant for me. I just want to get that book and put it next to my granddad. And that's, that's been my, that's been my motivation. So kind of getting it up early. I've got two young boys who are like under five. So trying to get up earlier than them, is difficult. <laughs> so be like, it's going earlier and earlier, my alarm clock, just to give me an hour before, before. The, yeah, yeah. Just, the just stay up. This is yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I'm, you know, I, I've been quite inspired by what you're doing really. I mean, it's, it's probably a space that, this of interest to me. I work in television, but you know, I've done a, a neuro linguistic program in. I'm basically a neuro linguistic pr practitioner, and um, there's a bit of hypnosis involved with that as well. I, I did that at the end of last year, but I'm also keen to combine it because I I, I, I like the holistic approach because in terms of the mind, but in terms of breath work and stuff, and the meditation has been a big thing for me. You know, it's it's been. It, it's been maybe understanding my mind directly in terms of the, the patterns that happen with thoughts and stuff. Um, it's just trying to combine those really. So I, I'm a bit wary because I've got a tendency to try and spin too many plates at once and then you see that some of them are starting to fall down. So listen, I've got two boys in the five, so 
them they're my priority first and foremost and you know the family like some people will say that they're family people but actually you know it's only in terms of this coronavirus where you're maybe supposed to spend with time with family <laughs> some people might think oh actually not as, as as much of a family guy as i used to think i'm but they they've always been caught you know integral to me amazing but also I'm pas- passionate about this space. And like my wife looks at some of the books I read and she's like, why are you reading that? Because I'm just like intrigued with yeah. the human condition and, and like you say about performance and, and well-being. But yeah, the, the, the aim would be to try and set up some kind of coaching business, but with elements of maybe meditating and, and stuff as well. But that that's why it's been opening, connecting with people like yourselves because honestly, a lot of my friends locally and stuff, they're not in into the stuff i'm into so sometimes that can feel like a lonely place you, you feel a little bit like i oh, just just follow the crowd and i'm and you slip into ways of thinking where i've been younger you know when i was at when i was playing football and stuff for instance like a lot of the um the fancy stuff didn't really appeal to me but then i was like well it appeals to everyone else so i'll just follow everyone else you know it's, it's the easiest thing to do and i think as i get older you're a little bit more like no this this is what i'm about and this is what fires me up and it's been quite eye-opening and it's been um you, you reaching out to me and stuff and you sharing the same stories and you, you don't it, the world doesn't feel such a such a lonely place yeah and i think you know I, I call it flicking the switch you know where and it doesn't it doesn't have to be you know all tree huggy and on all that type no, of stuff no. where people label it of oh, it's all a bit spiritual which you know is for some people and they go on to that but i think yeah. I think when you flick the switch in terms of whether it's, you know, learning, I, I was, I wasn't very academic in school. I got my GCSEs yeah. and, and, and my A-levels, et cetera, but it didn't come easy to me. But, you know, once I, I flicked that switch and, and, and broke down those beliefs that I couldn't learn because it was the style of learning that it was presented was my barrier. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm very visual, so I can watch a video. I can, I'll assimilate the information and I'll remember it. If someone was to stand there and lecture me, I find it quite difficult. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's why with our training, we always use all sorts of you know props and videos and, and real life things to bring it to life, to, to hit all those sort of learning styles, if you like. It needs to be a, a rich learning environment. But um, fascinating story, Rodri. Uh, unbelievable um, backdrop. And it puts another view on the world of professional sport, doesn't it? That it's not all sunshine and rainbows, even though we were aspiring for that when we started. Um, but more importantly, it's not about what's happened to us, how we respond, how we come out of it at the back end is that we can, you know, have that positive influence on people. So just to wrap up, mate, thanks very much for your time. I've got no doubt that, you know, wherever this goes, we will put all the contact details for you below it. So if people want to reach out and follow up, whether it's LinkedIn, email addresses or your agent, et cetera, for your, for your talks. Um, and I've got no doubt that your book will actually get translated into English as well, because I think there'll be enough people wanting to know that. Well, it's, a, it's a weird thing, really. Welsh is my first language in terms of my mum and my, my dad speak Welsh. It's a weird thing. But I've always, I've always liked thinking English a lot of the time, yeah. and I write better in English. It's, it's been, a lot of the time, I'm thinking of the English, and then I got translated to Welsh. It's, it's a weird thing, really. But, um, it's a skill Welsh in itself, though, isn't it? It's a skill, and yeah, I, yeah, I find it yeah. fascinating with people that can speak five, six, seven languages that you know, you've got to have a base language to then translate it into or yeah, direct yeah. across. So it's, uh, it's fascinating. But thanks for your time, Rodri. I really appreciate it. And, and I know the guys have found it really insightful and I look forward to chatting to you again soon. Yeah, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao, mate. Ciao, ciao. Bye.